That's right, by the sound of those applause, you know you're on the Moser Report. Welcome back, everybody. Hey, your host, Eric Jack, coming at you from a brand new Mozu Pro studio. It is hot and sweaty in this garage, and you're glad you can't feel it. All right, so today, I've got Michael Akini with me, a uh, guy that's got a game out called uh, Chaos and Alchemy, and we're going to talk to him. He's uh, getting ready to fund a kick, uh, Kickstarter's ready to go. He's working with a publisher, and uh, we want to talk to him about that and see just how life's going for that side of the house. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk to Mr. Akini. Mike, how are you, sir? Very good. How about you, Eric? Not too bad, not too bad. All right. First things first, give me a little bit, my, myself and the audience, a little bit of information on who you are and the overall where you're from as far as just life in general. Sure. So, uh, so I'm a uh, guy living in Colorado, like you said. I uh, got my wife and four cats here. By day, I work in finance. I do research there and uh, love my day job. But uh, I'm a gamer at heart. You know, I've been playing board games and role-playing games for a long time. And so uh, it's been, been a bit of a passion of mine as a player, and it's only recently in the last year or two that I've decided that uh, I'm interested in design as well. Very cool, very cool. And I, I have caught that bug in the past myself. <laughs> so uh, before we uh, get into anything, of course, we're here about you, Chaos and Alchemy, the game yes. itself that we're talking about. Where did the idea come from? Uh, maybe a little bit of background about the game. Give me just a general overview of what we're doing. Sure. So like I said, I wasn't always a game designer and Chaos and Alchemy is my first design. And the inspiration came, uh, actually I was listening to a podcast about gaming, more of a role-playing game podcast. Some of your listeners might be familiar with uh, the Genisodes. And just happened to be a recording of a panel of game designers, role-playing game designers, and, and somebody just happened to mention, you know, a game can come from a unique dice mechanic. And for somehow, some reason those words, a unique dice mechanic, made me pause the podcast, drive it home from work one day, and think, what would a unique dice mechanic be? And I just found myself pondering that, and, and I had an idea for a mechanic that originally I was thinking, this could be a role-playing game thing. I like role-playing games, but I quickly realized, you know, this would be more interesting for more of a board game, a card game. And, and the mechanic that I was thinking about was you could have, uh, you roll a pair of dice, just regular six-sided dice, and you compare each of them to a shared six-sided die in the middle of the table. So you and your opponent are both trying to uh, to meet or beat this die. And if you roll both of your dice higher than that one in the middle, then that's really good for you. If they're both lower, that's really bad for you. If one's higher and one's lower, that's a mixed result. And, and this turned into, in Chaos and Alchemy, what became the whole experiment mechanic. That's kind of the core of the game. So, so Chaos and Alchemy, I should say, is a game where the players are both alchemists, and your goal is you're building an alchemical laboratory. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. So you've got a deck of cards, a shared deck that uh, all the players draw from. You can play with anywhere from two to five players. I tend to like it best with three or four. And uh, you start with a couple cards in hand, and you have these dice, these experiment dice. And when it's your turn, you'll have uh, one die that you don't even have to roll. That is a free success in your experiment. No rolling needed. So you have one success to begin with. And then you have three other dice that are your experiment dice, and you'll roll all three of them and you compare each one to the fortune die that's in the middle of the table. So the fortune die just is on a four to start with, and let's say you roll a three, a four, and a six. Well, the three is lower than the four, so that's a failure in your experiment. The four and the six are at least as high as the fortune die. Those are going to be more successes. And then what you do with these, each success lets you play a card from your hand. And these are going to be things like uh, equipment you put into your laboratory or, uh, or, or special abilities that you gain as an alchemist from doing experiments and learning cool things. Uh, so those let you play your cards. Or if you want to, you could also use a success to draw a new card from the deck. And then each failure you get, you have to discard a card from your hand. So part of the strategy is, you know, you take those in whatever order you want. You play all the cards from your hand. Then you don't have to discard anything for your failure because you're out of cards anyway. And then you draw some more cards. And the goal is build up that laboratory with enough points. Uh, first one to 10 points wins. You get to turn lead into gold. Awesome. And a, and a really cool theme uh, as far as for a game. And the question, a uh, real quick question I have is on the successes. Is it if the target is three and you roll a five, that die counts as two successes? Or is it just one total success? It's, it's either a success or a failure for each die. So the best you can do, you got that free success. You have three more dice. So your best outcome is four total successes. Uh, the worst would be just the one free success and then three failures. But of course, being an alchemist, you can get new stuff. There are some cards that would let you roll extra dice, or they would let you change that fortune die. 
and, and I should mention, you know, I said it starts on a four for your target number, but that can change throughout the course of the game. Certain cards will let you change it, but the main way it changes is the chaos part of chaos and alchemy. Whenever you roll doubles in an experiment, that's chaos. And that's when you pick up the fortune die and re-roll it. So the target number, it might get easier if the target number becomes a one or a two. It might get harder if the target number becomes a five or a six on the fortune die. And, uh, and when you do that, you get your choice of, let's say you roll a pair of threes and a five when the fortune die is on a four. You can either say, okay, those threes are failures, the five's a success, and now I'm going to re-roll it. Or you could say, I'm going to re-roll it first and count my, my successes and failures based on whatever I get. So maybe you get lucky, you re-roll it, and it's a two. Great, it's all successes. Of course, maybe you get unlucky and you roll a six. Now your threes and five are all failures. <laughs> so you have to make your decision there. But uh, every time you roll doubles, that's chaos and fortunes change. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, yeah, that really is. And I'm really jealous of that dice mechanic. As a, <laughs> as a matter of fact, just so we're both aware, I, I really like the, the thought process behind that. All right. So now uh, you and I were talking beforehand, and uh, you had mentioned in Gen, uh, Gen Con 2012, mm -hmm. with Gen Con being one of my most favorite conventions ever. Um, you did a small run of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chaos and Alchemy and got a booth and, and went. How did that go for you? Well, it was kind of cool. So I, I should tell you that the whole creation process of Chaos and Alchemy was crazy fast. I'll tell other designers out there, I, I don't really recommend doing it quite this quickly, but it was 10 weeks from the time I first had that idea until I was at Gen Con showing this game off. That's uh, which was It was definitely kind of insane. Yeah, I, I've been working on other games since then, and they're not that fast. But uh, But it was a very fast process. You know, I did um, I built a prototype right away, just made up some cards, you know, print them up, stick them in with magic cards and shuffle them up and play. Just me and my wife to start with, try with some friends. And originally there wasn't that theme, the, the alchemy theme that came after a couple of play tests and realized, oh, it's like an experiment now. So I started play testing over the first couple of weeks and I realized I've got something here. This is a really cool idea. So found a graphic designer, a friend of mine uh, here in Colorado who's since moved to, to uh, Washington and now works for Wizards of the Coast doing graphic design for them, a woman named Bree Heiss. She's a good friend of mine, so I hired her to do graphic design for the layout of the cards and um, the card back illustration. And I started finding illustrators just to do little black and white pencil sketches, nothing too fancy, because this is just going to be a small print run that I did. Uh, found a printer, found a dice supplier, uh, found a packaging solution, and so did all this stuff. Uh, printed up 125 copies and took them with me to Gen Con. And I didn't have a booth or anything. This is just more of a demo type thing. So I just flagged people down like, hey, you want to try out this new game just in the board game area? And so I kind of got the word out about, about Chaos and Alchemy. And uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, I'm not a natural salesman. Uh, so I had my brother-in-law, who, who is very much a natural salesman, came and showed me how to just flag strangers down like, hi, come on, try a new game. And it's a nice thing. When you're at Gen Con, people want to play games. So it's not that hard to get them to, to try it out. But it was great. It was really popular. Um, people had a good time with it. And over the next couple of months, by uh, the middle of October 2012, I'd, I'd sold through my whole print run. Wow. Well, that yeah. is awesome. And I mean, the, the worst part, you know, the worst thing is I didn't see you while we were there because I was there doing coverage <laughs> and it would have been really cool. To uh, sorry I missed you. Oh, yeah. I could have talked to you last year about this. This would have been awesome. But no, that is, uh, it's always good to hear positive um, positive things from, from the smaller end because obviously you were putting yourself out there on a limb. Mm -hmm. and you know it ended up working and that's a testament to you and well the the people skills of your brother-in-law and uh <laughs> once he's got him sat down though the game and since you sold out you know in, in a couple of months that's very very cool now right now i believe you're working with game salute is that correct that's right okay so how did game salute get uh get involved well, so like I said, I sold out of my my print run uh, by the middle of October, and so I had to think, what's next? You know, I only did 125 copies, and just with that black and white art, so I knew that that was kind of a test run thing. Do people like this? And selling through it in a couple of months, yeah, pe people like it. So I thought, all right, now I want to do a real print run, do, you know, 1,000, maybe 2,000 copy print run, uh, where the costs come down per unit, and I can actually sell to game stores and everything. Uh, and I wanted to do it with color illustrations, too, rather than just the black and white sketches. So all that, of course, costs money so my plan was to uh, either work with a publisher or do my own Kickstarter and I had done a lot of work shopping around at publishers really H had I had it farther in advance I would have probably made appointments with publishers to meet them at Gen Con and stuff but I, it was kind of a quick process so I didn't really have that ability so I decided I'm just gonna dive in do my own Kickstarter and I started laying the groundwork for that. You know, I'd gotten quotes from manufacturers about how much it would cost to print the game if I do 1,000 or 2,000. Uh, I'd started lining up uh, illustrators for doing color artwork uh, and all that stuff. Had it pretty much taken care of. Started setting up my Kickstarter page, you know, started working on video. And as I was doing this, 
uh, Game Salute actually ended up approaching me. Uh, the way that worked is uh, some of your your viewers might be familiar with the Dice Tower podcast, which is very well listened to in the in, in the board game world. And uh, Tom Vassell, the guy who hosts that, does uh, you can hire him for sort of an advertising on the Dice Tower. He'll do a video preview uh, of a game that you're working on for Kickstarter. So I decided, okay, I'm, I want to get the word about the Kickstarter. I hired Tom to do a video preview. And uh, so he, he got the game and he tried it out and he wanted to have a phone call to just clarify the rules, make sure he was playing it right. And in the course of that conversation, I asked him about Game Salute because I had a little bit of contact with them before, but hadn't heard from him in a while. Um, and he said, yeah, I, I know the guy who, uh, who's in charge of the company and I'll, uh, I'll put you guys in touch with each other. And apparently they had a conversation and, and Tom said enough nice things about the game that uh, when I talked to Dan Yarrington from Game Salute on the phone the next day, He's like, you know, if you're interested, we'd be happy to publish Chaos and Alchemy. And I said, sounds great. You guys are good at this, so so let's work together. Wow, yeah, that is uh, that's a that's a pretty smooth intro, and <laughs> that's I like that. I like that yeah. a lot, and it, it go, does go to prove that sometimes it's definitely who you know and or who you're talking to, who they know. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, and and when is... I reached out to Tom, it was with no ideas of getting in touch with publishers or anything. It oh. just happened to go that way because Game Salute, of course, had published his game, uh, Nothing Personal, that was on Kickstarter right around that time last year. So I knew he already had a connection with them, and it just worked out that they were they're, they're looking for games from small publishers like me. Well, hey, man, again, that's that's just awesome because it, it's always good to see how things just kind of fall into place for some folks. Yeah. So very cool. Now, um. What do we, we we talked real quick about just the general overview of the game. Mm -hmm. um, what is what are you running? You know, we know the concept. Obviously, you're trying to sure. turn lead into gold. You're running your lab. Uh, components and like age range of audience. What are you looking for for this game? And you know, what are the components to make it up? Sure. So the components. This is actually one of the nice things about it. It's fairly compact. It is basically uh, a deck of ninety cards. 85 of those are cards you're going to play within the game, and then there's five cards that just track your successes and failures, a place to put your dice, you know, success dice and failure dice. Uh, so 85 cards plus the five tracker cards. Uh, it comes with a bunch of dice. Uh, the, the version that I did last year came with 26 dice. Um, there was the fortune die, uh, green dice to be your free successes, and then a whole bunch of uh, 20 dice to be just experiment dice that were all black. And the components with the Game Salute version are going to be similar. We're probably going to use blank cubes for the free successes because you don't really roll them. It gets a little confusing as to why do I have this die if I never roll it? Well, it's just a marker. So blank cubes for that. Uh, and for our base goal, the plan is we're going to have uh, just, again, black dice for everybody for the experiment dice. Uh, but if we have a hit a stretch goal, we'd like to have every player gets their own color dice. So you can have the blue dice or the red dice or the yellow dice, uh, which is kind of nice. It's just nice to have your own color. But that's a, a little more expensive to make. So that'll be the plan. You'll have the cards and a bunch of dice. Uh, you'll have a rule book, of course, explaining things in the box itself. So pretty straightforward, basically cards and dice. And as far as the age range goes, uh, when I printed it, it was 13 and up. Uh, I'd say a smart 10-year-old can probably handle it, uh, but the cards do have words on them, like you know a Magic the Gathering type card would. You have to understand it says whenever you experiment, you do this, or you know you get to put this in your opponent's laboratory and make their life more difficult. You have to understand how all that works. So um, 13 and up is kind of the, the guideline there, but you know, a clever kid who's a little bit younger would probably be fine with it. And it's a fairly quick game. This is not a deep strategy game. You know, you're rolling a lot of dice here. So it's more of a, a beer and pretzels type of fun game that uh, takes about 10 minutes per player. So if you play a two-player game, you know, 15, 20 minutes tops. If you play a five-player game, it can be more like 45 minutes or so. Uh, and like I said, I think the sweet spot is really three to four players is great. You know, about a half an hour or so. And uh, you have some choice about who you mess with when you get one of those cards that lets you make your opposing alchemist's life harder. So uh, I really like it there when it's about a half an hour game. Very cool, very cool. And speaking of some of the cards, uh, mm -hmm. you sent a bunch of art along, and I'd like to look at two of those here during the video, uh, sure. the interview, and then the rest of uh, folks for the audience are gonna be as a slideshow at the end. Awesome. So why don't I, I'll bring up the first one here. We'll screen share it up. Great. Okay, so here we go, a card, uh, Fan the Flames. Yes. All right, so tell us about this card. So Fan the Flames, you can see in the upper left corner, it has that red rune icon. Uh, this is what's called a reaction card. Uh, there's not very many of these in the deck, but a reaction card is the only card that doesn't cost you a success to play. You'll usually play this on somebody else's turn. And you can see the text there, it says, if an opponent uses a rival or misfortune card, and the little symbols next to that are the symbols that you'll see on rival cards or misfortune cards. Uh, if they play one that affects you, then you can toss out Fan the Flames, and that lets you draw two cards and then play a card for free. So basically, when somebody else messes with you, you're like, oh yeah, well here, I'm gonna now do something awesome in response to that with Fan the Flames. Our next card will be, 
Heaven's Watch. So Heaven's Watch, the icon in the top left corner, that the blue icon there looks kind of like an A. That is an action card. And action cards are cards that you spend a success to play it, and then it does its thing and then just goes to the discard pile. It doesn't stick around like uh, innovation cards would. Uh, but this one is very straightforward in what it does. It says set the fortune die to any number you wish. So the fortune die, remember, is the one that you're trying to meet or beat when you do your experiments. And the nice thing about Heaven's Watch is if you want to, you could use it before you experiment. You could use your free success to say, I'm going to set the fortune die to a one or a two to make my life nice and easy. And then you roll your experiment, and you're probably going to get more successes out of it. The other way you can use a card like Heaven's Watch is after you experiment, let's say the fortune die is on a two right now and you just finished your experiment, you're like, the next guy's going to go, and I don't want him to have this easy two. I'm going to play Heaven's Watch and change that to a six. Good luck, buddy. Wow. Okay. Well, that's kind of that's kind of rough right there. So, <laughs> it's, roll the hard six and see what happens, pal. Exactly. That's all I got for you. Um, and I'll I say, have... when you're doing an experiment, even if the fortune dies on a six, you can still get a success by rolling a six. You also can get lucky if you roll doubles, remember. That's chaos. You'll re-roll the fortune die. So, you know, maybe you roll a pair of fours, and then you re-roll the fortune die, and hey, it's a three now. You know, there, there's ways out of it. You're not stuck with that six forever. Absolutely. No, and again, I love that dice mechanic. All right, so we've got the game. We've seen some of the art, and it's beautiful, by the way. I love the card layouts, um, and the art is very cool. Um, what are we looking for is a timeline. Um, obviously, hopefully, you know, GameStar is going to do this uh, Kickstarter. When when can I give you my money? Okay. So, you know, take it. <laughs> pretty soon, pretty soon. And yeah, and I'll mention, by the way, uh, the, the, the cards we just saw here, this version of the game is the one that uh, Game Salute set up. So a guy named Dan May did all that layout work. He's fantastic. And the artist is named Engar Adarasa, a guy in the, Indonesia, I believe. He's done a fantastic job with the illustration so far. So uh, there's a plan is we're still finishing up the, the, the page. Uh, I'm going to be working with Michael Fox at Game Salute. He's going to be running the campaign. I've seen a preview page for the Kickstarter. It's coming along nicely. Uh, plan is sometime in the next couple weeks. So I think this is dropping around the 11th of July, something like that, if I remember right, when we talked about it. Probably within the two weeks after that. Don't know the exact date, uh, but sometime by, you know, the 22nd, 23rd of July, I think the Kickstarter campaign will be live. Very cool. Now, I'll assume they're doing the 30-day Kickstarter, not one of the shorter ones? Yep. I think they're going to do a standard 30-day Kickstarter. Nothing, nothing too fancy there. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Well, you have definitely sort of gone on the fast track from a uh, quick run last year at Gen Con to suddenly you got a Kickstarter running through Game Salute. I salute you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, very cool, very cool. And uh, I can see uh, a pledge for me coming your way. It sounds like a very <laughs> cool game. That's awesome. Um, I love that I've uh, got a Sunday crew here that likes to come in and play games, and I, they definitely are uh, hungry for new ones. So uh, we'll definitely give it a shot. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, sir, uh, as we wrap up here and uh, we've given everybody a really good, cool look at Cass and Alchemy, is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience uh, before we cut this loose? Sure. Uh, I just want to tell folks, if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, Clay Crucible Games. You can kind of see the banner behind me. That, that's my game company. So I'm uh, at Clay Crucible on Twitter. Uh, and I post information. At, you can go to chaosandalchemy.com if you want to see the full rule book and things like that. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be a game designer now on the side. I'm working on my next design for a, a tile placement worker movement game called Alchemy Bazaar. So if you've got any folks out there who like what they hear here today and are interested in maybe helping out with play testing in the future or learning more about future games that I'm developing, have them follow me on Twitter and drop me a line. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate that word, Michael. Uh, folks, that again was Michael Akini, Chaos and Alchemy. Look for it on Kickstarter coming out soon. You saw it here first, at least this version, on the Moser Report. Michael, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Eric. Definitely enjoyed it. A great talk, and I'm sure we'll uh, maybe we'll talk soon after uh, a successful Kickstarter. Fantastic. I look forward to it. All right. Awesome. Until next time, guys. You've been on the Moser Report. We'll be back.